Hello there, everybody. This is Al Blumkin. We're back with the uh, other segment of uh, David Nemec's all-time baseball history and trivia. Today we're going to be covering the years 1958 through 1960. And uh, with me is uh, uh, my co-host, David Nemec, and our uh, usual guest, Ian Kahanowitz. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. Good to be here once yeah. again. Yeah, well... Uh, let's start already with 1958, which is unique because it was, the f- it was the first year since 1883 that there was no na- National B- League Baseball in New York City. Uh, the Dodgers and Giants, after 1957, packed up and moved out to Los Angeles and San Francisco, respectively. And uh, in New York, it was very, very strange because... Uh, most of the National League fans, the Dodgers and Giants fans, would uh, do a lot of other things before they ever agreed to root for the Yankees. So uh, the, uh, the fans of those teams here mostly were walking around uh, like they were at a funeral, missing uh, you know, the usual sounds of... Uh, play ball in Ebbets Field and the Polo Grounds. That was a strange season. Uh, Not a strange season of uh, what happened on the field, but a strange season uh, with the Dodgers and Giants being out in San Francisco. The Dodgers decided to play in Los Angeles Coliseum, which uh, was built for the 1932 Olympics and was built for track and football. The uh, NFL Los Angeles Rams played there. But for baseball, it was uh, not particularly a good field. Uh, They had to uh, put a screen in there. They changed the dimensions, and there was a screen left field a couple hundred feet away, which uh, uh, was uh, easy. But a similar distance from the polo grounds in in left field. It met the, and, made, met the major league requirements, but just by a hair. And the right field was, uh, uh, yeah, Duke Snyder, who was from California, took a look at the right field out in the LA Coliseum, and he <laughs> right away be- wished he was back in New York. And the reason they went there, because the other ballpark that uh, they considered was uh, Los Angeles Wrigley Field, where the uh, minor league angels uh, play then, and that place only held uh, about 23,000 people, while the Coliseum held 90,000 people. So uh, O'Malley, being who he was, uh, opted to play in the, Los, in the baseball in the Los Angeles Coliseum. The Giants, meanwhile, went to Seal Stadium, the old minor league park. Uh, in San Francisco, David, were you out there when they played in? Uh, in no, but I was in. I was in. I was. I visited L.A. in 1959. I saw the Dodgers play in the Coliseum. I put, I saw them play the Giants there actually. Uh, and at that time, uh, Major League Baseball teams, after the seventh inning or midway through the seventh inning, usually would allow anyone in for free who happened to be loitering outside the gates. Now that's and, how I got to Forbes Field quite a few times. Yeah, that uh, that uh, one occasion, uh, uh, my college roommate and I were indeed among the lucky ones who were outside the gates at the right time, and we wandered in and saw a 15-inning battle between the uh, Giants and Dodgers, uh, almost the equivalent of an entire nine-inning game for free, and uh, saw Jim Bavenport park one over the uh, left field screen win the game. Uh, proved to be the winning run in the 15th inning. And that happened to me once in Forbes Field, because I usually went to all the games when I was at that pit there. And one day, for, one night, for whatever reason, I couldn't. And, uh, you know, they opened the gates in the seventh inning, and the game went 16. So, <laughs> Well, you were even luckier. Oh, yeah. We got a game for free. Well, you know, the left field bleachers there were a buck. And when we got ambitious, we'd sit in the grandstand for three hours. <laughs> You know, that's what the prices were in those days. But yeah. the, uh, I believe the Giants opened the season playing the Dodgers, and Ruben Gomez, 
who had won a game in the 1954 World Series for them, was a starter in the the starter in the, the first game in the uh, between the two of them out in the West Coast. The Giants won the game eight nothing. Meanwhile, back in New York, the Yankees had the, the town to themselves, and they didn't show uh, an appreciable gain in attendance. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they didn't, they didn't show an appreciable uh, gain in attendance because uh, until for the, most of the season, it was the Yankees and the seven dwarfs. I believe, and you can check this out, that right in the beginning of August of that season, the Yankees uh, were the only team in the league over 500. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, look at August 1st or August 2nd standings in the American League from 1958, then the Yankees are the only team over 500. And uh, since they had a quid so early, they went into a uh, slump for the last two months and only wound up winning 92 games. Uh, and this, they really didn't uh, get out of the slump until the last three games of uh, that World Series. Uh, Mantle had an off year. Ford uh, uh, was hurt the last two months. He wound up leading the league and they were on average. Uh, Bob Turley was the big story for the Yankees that year. He went 21 and 7 uh, and won the uh, won the Cy Young Award that season. And that was his last, that really his last good season. And, yeah, he, uh, yeah, I remember him. He had a phenomenal year. He was tough, tough, yeah. really tough. Man. And the yeah. MVP was uh, Jackie Jensen, who led the American League in RBIs uh, that year for the Red Sox. And uh, uh, yeah, he won the MVP, and the batting title was won, won by uh, some guy in Boston who wore number nine, who was uh, only a mere 40 years old when he hit 328 that season. Theodore Samuel Williams. Yeah, yeah. It was generally a down year offensively. And you look at, you know, Jensen really, it, it, other than apart from winning the RBI crown, um, did not put up terrific numbers by any means. Now, Mantle uh, well, won the home run crown with 40. He only yeah, over 94 yeah, runs yeah, that season, yeah. Yeah, he did. Mantle, Mantle had a good year. He, he justifiably could have been the MVP, too. Uh, but I think people were tired of seeing the Yankees being, you know, winning almost any every MVP award. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that, that they were uh, winning all the time in that year. It was uh, yeah, especially it tired easy. In general, yeah. to see the Yankees winning, winning yeah. Yeah, every season. So, it, uh, yeah, but in 1958, except for you know the Indians, uh, they they won everything since. Yeah, National League was another story. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the Braves repeated, and all of a sudden, the Pittsburgh Pirates, who have been languishing in the second division uh, since 1949, uh, put together the big innings of the team that would wind up winning the uh, 1960 uh, World Series, and they finished a strong second to the Braves. They weren't uh, eliminated until there was a week left in the season, and uh, you know, they beat out the uh, St. Louis Cardinals for second place. Uh, the the Dodgers, the first year in L.A., fell all the way to seventh place. They had a very, very big year. All the boys of summer uh, that were still there, Reese, uh, Ferrillo, Hodges, Snyder, all started to get old at once. Uh, Carl Erskine was still there. Newcomb they had sent to the uh, Cincinnati Reds. And uh, Campanello, of course, uh, in the off season uh, before that that year, uh, was, had a very, very horrible oil accident and was paralyzed from uh, essentially from the shoulders, shoulders down. Yeah. And they went out, and, the, and, the, and conversely in San Francisco, the... Uh, in San Francisco, the Giants brought up a whole bunch of rookies headed by uh, Orlando Cepeda, uh, Felipe Alou, and J- Jim Davenport, and played very, very well. They came in third, and they, they believe, I think they came in third, and the Cardinals came in fourth. And uh, so the Braves uh, repeated, 
Uh, the big cha- change in the Braves that year was they had changes for the red changes for the entire season. Uh, Bob Hazel uh, turned out to be uh, a terrific flash in the pan and was traded to Detroit. And uh, and they, uh, mid-season Bill Bruton torn up his knee was uh, uh, torn up his knee. Uh, came back into the lineup, and Bob Buell, who was their third starter, came down with uh, a sore arm for most of the season. So, uh, Spine and Warren Spine and Lou Burdett worked their tails off, and they won the pennant by a uh, you know fairly comfortable margin. They had the identical record with the Yankees that year. They were both yeah. They were both ninety two and. Uh, Fifty-six, I think it was, or fifty-two, something like that. Yeah, the MVP uh, winning the first of two consecutive MVPs was Ernie Banks. Yeah, of the Cubs, who uh, finished in the fifth place with a seventy-seven, seventy-seven record. And you got Spawn, who became the first lefty to win twenty or more games nine times. Uh, yeah, he would take that to thirteen. Yeah, yeah, uh, but uh, you know, Ted Williams, you mentioned, he signed a, an extension for one hundred thirty-five. Thousand dollars, which was you know, unheard of in those days, and he was able to get his 17th career Grand Slam that year, and uh, and his thousandth um, extra base hit, I believe. Yeah, his one. Well, Stan Musial uh, managed to get uh, his 3,000th hit that season. Yeah, and he hit uh, 330, uh, around 330, but it wasn't enough to be out uh, Richie Ashburn. Who had 350 to win the uh, second NL batting title, and Willie Mays at 347. I believe Banks won the uh, uh, home runs and uh, RBI. Probably eyes that season. But I think um, if you if you refer to um, the new book on Casey Stengel, uh, again that Yankee slump that they did, uh, you know, after the half a season. Management started to look at Casey Stengel not as the superior manager he was already. That was kind of thinking that he's getting too old for this. Well, uh, yeah, the World Series would prove different. Right. I mean, because the Yankees. Uh, I, I watched almost every game of that series, and uh, uh, you know, I was on a, a, a high school size, a junior in high school, and. Uh, on the on the, uh, on the schedule I had uh, enabled me to watch uh, most of the games during the week, and uh, they lost three out of the first four to the Braves. They lost uh, the first and second game. The second game they were bombed 13 to five in Milwaukee. The third game was very interesting. Don Lawson and Ryan Duran combined to shut out the uh, Braves four nothing. They beat the uh, pitcher by the name of Bob Rush who they had gotten from the uh, Cubs. In that game uh, Hank Bauer got three of the Yankees four hits and drove in all four of the runs and that extended his World Series uh, hitting streak to uh, a record 17 games which still stands. And the next day uh, Norm Seaburn, uh, the Yankee left field and messed a couple of fly balls in the sun, but it didn't matter because uh, Warren Spahn, two hit them. And so the Yankees were down three games to one. And uh, in game five, Bob Torrey started, and the Yankees finally got to Lou Burdett and beat them 7 nothing in, in Yankee Stadium. The series went back to Milwaukee, and the uh, Braves... Uh, took a lead right in the game. The Yankees tied it up, but they beat Warren Spahn in extra innings. They brought in Bob Turley, who had just started two days before in game five, to finish the game and relieve really yeah. yeah. So the next day was game seven, and they were facing Lou Burdett again. And it was two up. Larson, who Don Larson started the game, and he was pulled in the third inning. Uh, and they brought in Bob Turley again. And the Yankees uh, tied the game at two, and then uh, uh, they got a, a run in the uh, eighth inning to make it three to two, and then Bill Scourin 
hit a three-run home run to make it six to two, and that iced the game for the Yankees. Bob Tilly pitched six, uh, I believe, it was six and the third innings in that game. So he pitched in all three of the. Uh, uh, all three of the wins. And all three of the last wins, and. Uh, is that the last? Is that the last time a starter ever did ever did anything close to that? The guy who start, you know, who made a key start, key starts in the series. I think that in two thousand one, with uh, when they brought Randy Johnson, the Diamondbacks brought Randy Johnson in. I think that's the last game. Did he come three game. times in a row, though? No, I think three times in a row. Yeah, that's what was so phenomenal. I remember. I remember yeah, because that, uh, that year, uh, uh, besides uh, Whitey Ford and uh, Prof. Terrell, they didn't have very much at starting because both Johnny Cooks and uh, and uh, Tom Starvin blew their arms out. And, uh, the, you know, the rest of their pitching, starting pitching wasn't very, uh, very good. But the, the big the big difference for them that year was that Ryan Duran, who they had gotten from the uh, A's in the, uh, when they sent Billy Martin there in 57, uh, turned out to be a tremendous uh, relief pitcher for them. And he, uh, in fact, Ryan Duran, uh, interesting sidebar in that series was that Ryan Duran uh, uh, was pitching a relief and uh, the umpire behind home plate by a call that uh, the pitcher turned in light. So Duran put his hands to his throat, indicating choke. At Fort Frick, the uh, commissioner was in the hospital and saw it, and he fined Duran. I think it was uh, five hundred dollars for the gesture. <laughs> but all in all, it was uh, you know, all in all, nineteen fifty-eight was not that memorable of a season. Uh, well, correct me if I'm wrong. If the yeah. Braves had won that series, would they not have been the only National League team, except for the uh, 21-22 Giants, to beat the Yankees two series in a row? Yeah. You're yeah, absolutely right, yeah. Well, the yeah, Dodgers that's... had that opportunity in 1956, and the Cardinals had that opportunity in 1943, and neither of them did it. 43, and they couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. The Braves came to, uh, you know, they came really, you know, I, I remember that series very well. And, you know, being, being in the Midwest, we were all rooting for the Braves. But, yeah, you know, it, was, it turned out very differently. Well, they got their revenge on the Dodgers in 56, and they got revenge on the Braves. And there was bad blood between the teams because uh, uh, the Braves made some remarks after 1957, of course. It was started by Stengel, saying, called Milwaukee Bushville. So there was uh, there wasn't good blood, and the, and the people in Milwaukee uh, regarded uh, Tony Kubek, who was uh, by that time a Yankee shortstop and uh, was uh, a native of Milwaukee. They regarded him as a traitor. Yeah. Yeah. And two things. Two things that also went on. You mentioned Ford Frick. Yeah. And this year it was this year. Due to the 57 Cincinnati Red Legs stuffing the all-star ballots that he announced that only players and coaches, rather than the fans, would elect their lineups for the all-star game, and that would last uh, until the year I was born, 1970. And, right, uh, yeah. And a lot of people right. think they should go back to that. Exactly, yeah, you know, I mean, demographically, yeah. I mean, And also, uh, Vic Power of the Cleveland Indians, he only stole two bases that year. But both of those yeah. <laughs> steals occurred yeah. on the, the same game, uh, from third to home. He uh, stole home plate in one game, and uh, the last one was in the tenth inning where they beat the Tigers. So, uh, yeah, one of the yeah. more notable trades of that season was that uh, the uh, Kansas City Athletics traded uh, the power and Eddie Held to the Indians in June of that season uh, for a couple of my entities, Preston Ward and Dick Tomanek, and a promising young outfielder by the name of Roger Maris. Well, actually, you know, uh, Tomanek was a very promising pitcher, and Ward was having a pretty good year. And uh, it, it was—it it looked at the time like a very good trade for both teams. Uh, you know, Mar Calavito had been a disappointment. Uh, you know, and Maris was equally promising, and was, and also was something of a disappointment in Cleveland. Uh, so the, yeah, I remember the Indians fans felt they made out pretty well in that deal because power, power was the key for Cleveland. And Woody Held, 
was not a, not a throw-in by any means because he became a, a pretty big factor in Cleveland baseball for a number of years. No, Frank so Lang. Uh, trade all around. And Frank Lang uh, said, I read this in a few places, that when he made that trade, he knew that uh, Maris was on, a, was on a one-stop trip to the Yankees. But he felt he yeah. had to do that trade for the Indians. <clears throat> now, he would do trades for the Indians after 1959, which uh, basically was not very helpful. But uh, that's no, another story. Well, that's destroyed, a little yeah, that destroyed the morale, destroyed the team, and yeah. destroyed Cleveland baseball. For... I got to 1959, which is a really, really – Weird season. Very. Uh, the, uh, the big trade in the off season was uh, the Pirates had sent Frank Thomas, who uh, had hit 35 home runs and driven 109 runs the year before to the Reds for uh, Harvey Haddix, Smokey Burgess, and Don Hoke, all of whom would play uh, key roles in the, the 1960 championship. But 1959, uh, in the American League especially, the Yankees were getting old and hurt and uh, wound up with a record of 79 and 75 and finished in third place. You know, they were behind the uh, pennant winning Chicago White Sox and the Cleveland Indians. And the Indians and the White Sox uh, conducted a pretty spirited, uh, spirited, uh, race for the American League pennant, which wasn't decided until late September. Yeah, it was decided, actually, in a, uh, for all intents and purposes, in a four-game series in early September uh, when Cle- when the Chicago came to Cleveland. And on a Friday night, Saturday afternoon, a Sunday doubleheader. And uh, Indians fans uh, were looking forward to a sweep, which would kind of put would pretty well bury the White Sox. And it turned out to be a sweep, all right, but but, but by the White Sox. And uh, I went to I was at the Sunday doubleheader, uh, which pretty well crushed Cleveland fans. Uh, it was a very very disappointing uh, ending to you know pretty it pretty much ended the season. Although the White Sox did do a, uh, a slight fold toward toward the middle of the month and brought the Indians back into contention, and then returned to Cleveland late in the season when the Indians still had a mathematical chance that they swept the Sox. And once again, they couldn't produce the uh, Sox clinch when Power hit a sharp ground ball to Nellie Fox. And Fox and Aparicio turned the double play in the bottom of the ninth, and that was the clinching game. I was there for that, too. Uh, but it was it was an exciting year for Cleveland baseball, and the last time a uh, Cleveland team played a meaningful game in September until 1995. So wow, a long, long dry spell. Wow, the White Sox uh, were the epitome of uh, you know uh, uh, not having much of an offense until they acquired Ted Wazowski from the Pirates late in the season. They, I believe, they played a game uh, with the Kansas City A's uh, earlier in the season where they uh, beat them twenty to six and had an inning where they got eleven runs on one hit. Yeah, there was. Yeah, there was, there was something like uh, nine or ten walks in that inning. Yeah, errors, gap. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah, it was yeah. Well, uh, the Yankees really collapsed. Mantle had his probably the worst year of his uh, career up to you know up until 1965. The Yogi was getting old and playing the outfield most of the time, while Olsen Harris taking over the catching. The uh, uh, Bill Scarron has wrist broken in a collision at first base that put him out for the year. Uh, the only starting pitcher that held up at all was Whitey Ford, who went 16 and 10, which for him was a bad year. Bob Turley fell from winning the Cy Young to an 8 and 11 season, and he was getting belted all over the place. And uh, the key, the, what, what the key to that season, wherever that you knew it was over for them, is in early July the Yankees went up to. Uh, Boston for a five-game series, and uh, lost all five of them to the Red Sox, and none of them were really close. And that basically finished them for the season, Uh, and uh, a lot of people outside of New York were very, very happy to see the Yankees for the first time since, uh, basically since 1945, 
uh, get their comeuppance uh, so early in the season. And the other, the other teams, uh, Detroit, uh, Kansas City, Baltimore, Baltimore finally uh, started to show some signs of life. Because as we, uh, we, every, you know, we know that uh, they uh, came from the St. Louis Browns. And they were not, not very good the first several years they were in Baltimore. But they, they got Brooks Robinson, and they got a couple of young pitchers. They were starting to, uh, to uh, you know, make some noise. And, of course, the uh, Washington Senators uh, were uh, less than usual, but basically they had Seavers, Allison, Lemon, and Killebrew. They had a lot of home runs, but they couldn't do anything else. The National League was another story. The Dodgers, Braves, and Giants went back and forth uh, all season in the National League. Uh, the Pirates, who had shut showed so much promise the year before, uh, got sat in the backward circuit. Bob Friend dropped from 22 and 14 to 8 and 19. Bill Mazeroski hit 240, and uh, basically the only player on the team that produced uh, offensively was, uh, uh, of all people, Dick Stewart. And even Clemente had a uh, mediocre year for, by his standards. So they finished in fourth, but the race went down to the wire and wound up, uh, the Dodgers and the Braves wound up tied at the end of the season. They had a best two out of three playoff, and the Dodgers, who had finished seventh the year before, uh, seventh the year before, uh, won both playoff games and, uh, you know, won the National League pen. The Giants did uh, well up until September, and uh, uh, Sam Jones, a starting pitcher that they had, the yeoman life work, and won 21 and lost 15. And looked, it seemed at the end of the season like he was uh, out there every day. Johnny Antonelli won 19 games, couldn't get his 20th for the rest of the season, and uh, you know, that basically was the, uh, the end of his career. But the Braves were playing without... Red Shaney's who had come down with tuberculosis. And uh, they used seven second basemen uh, that season, uh, who I dubbed the Magnificent Seven, who were inadequately replaced Bobby Avila. I mean, Red Shaney's at, uh, at second base that season. Bobby Avila, who I just mentioned, the former bank champion for the Cleveland Indians in 1954, was one of them, and he was the only one of the seven that was actually a major league ball player at one time or another. Yeah. They had Casey Wise and Johnny O'Brien and uh, Felix Mantilla and uh, Joe Morgan, the one who managed the Red Sox, not the Hall of Famer, and uh, a couple of others who, uh, who whose name uh, names Chuck Cottier was one of them, another one who couldn't yeah. hit. Yeah. And uh, this, despite the fact that uh, Henry Aaron and Eddie Matthews were having terrific years, Henry Aaron hit 355, became the first player since uh, Musial in 1948 to have a season where he had 400 total bases. Matthews won the home run title. And, you know, it's good years out of both uh, Warren Spahn and Lou Burdett and the reliever Don McMahon. But... Uh, uh, the hole at second base was just uh, too big for them to uh, uh, to uh, recover from. The Dodgers had made a trade, a fairly unnoticed trade uh, in the off season, which proved dividends for them. They sent the uh, outfield to Gino Simoli to the Cardinals for Wally Moon, yeah, the rookie of the year in 1954, who had a really really big year for the Cardinals in 1958. And Moon uh, developed the technique. He was a left-handed theory, developed the technique to hit uh, balls over the uh, fence in the uh, in the Los Angeles Coliseum and left. They became known as moon moonshots. Shot. They became known as moonshots. Yeah. And somehow they managed to patch together a team that could win the uh, the regular season. Uh, ended with both the Braves and the Dodgers winning 86 games, and neither of these teams were overwhelming. And uh, 
one of the more interesting games in that season was on my 16th birthday, May 26th, where Harvey Haddock's in Milwaukee pitching for the Pirates. Well, they have uh, pitched 12, 12, 12 innings of perfect ball before losing the game in the 13th inning. In a very bizarre fashion. A, a bizarre play. And uh, uh, well, one of the interesting things is when you look at the box score of that game, neither Dick Grote nor Roberto Clemente played in the game. And Lou Burdett had shot the Pirates out uh, with 12 hits, and uh, yeah, it was uh, nobody, nobody before before or since uh, that has ever pitched a game uh, where they retired 30 strict, 30 strict eight straight batters, and of course, with the way pitchers are used today, that's in all probability never going to happen again. So we get to the World Series, which is unusual because the White Sox are playing the Dodgers. And you have to have, Ian, you have, to have been uh, following it in that era to realize how unusual it was. This is the first time that no New York team had been in the World Series since 1948. Yeah. It was very, very weird. And the White and Sox also stayed. The first, first, the first series where the, or the uh, Eastern, I think the Eastern Time Zone, except for was maybe, uh, maybe the, well, when the when the Cubs and White Sox, well, there wasn't anything. So I don't know what the time zones were in 1906, but uh, when the two, two St. Louis teams played. In 1944. Yeah, because Detroit were, is in the east. In central. Yeah. And Detroit, yeah, Detroit was in the central times as well. Detroit, Detroit didn't have daylight savings. They were in the daylight Yeah, you're right, yeah. Central time zone. But, uh, yeah, this was the first time when the central time zone and the Pacific time zone were meeting. And the first of many times that the Pacific time zone would be involved in the World Series. But, uh, it was quite, it, uh, it made for some, Weird scheduling in the World Series, as I recall, the time when the times the game started, because they were all televised, and they were all day games. Yeah, I know. I, I remember watching the uh, first game, uh, which was at uh, Comiskey Park, where uh, Ted Kuzuski hit two home runs, and the uh, White Sox behind uh, their uh, ace of that season, early win, who they had gotten uh, from the Indians two years before, uh, who won the uh, American League Cy Young Award that season at the age of 39. They beat the Dodgers 11 nothing. So uh, here it is. Uh, you know, the Dodgers are in the World Series again, and they get clobbed in the first game. And everybody figured, well, it's the same old Dodgers, even though they were in L.A. It didn't work out that way. The Dodgers won the next three games. Uh, Larry Sherry, who was a relief pitcher for the Dodgers, became the pitching hero of that series. He came in and won two games in relief and saved the other two games. Uh, the, the, yeah. the White Sox uh, won the fifth game, won nothing, behind Dick Donovan. And uh, the, 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 they came back to Chicago and the, the, the Dodgers put the game out of uh, reach pretty early and they wound up winning that game 8-3. to three. And it took the Dodgers who came into the National League in 19, 1890, 65 years to win their first World Series in Brooklyn, and two years to win their first <laughs> World Series in Los Angeles. Yeah. Ian, you have anything to add? Yeah, that was huge because, again, the whole, you know, again, back home, you know, you guys lived the era. What was the feeling in Brooklyn when the Dodgers won, you know? I mean, They were very upset. There was a, I think it was very mixed. There were some, yeah. there were some Brooklyn Knights. There were some did, people who did, 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 did stick with the Dodgers. But, uh, yeah, they held on to the team until the boys of summer were all gone. Yeah. So it's like the, you know, yeah. certain Giant fans held on to the uh, Giants be, just simply because of Willie Mays. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two other things about the 1959 season that uh, – uh, one, we, we talked a bit about Roberto Clemente, and Clemente came up as a tremendously, tremendously promising player. But through 1959, he had yet to have a season in which he had produced uh, an 800 OPS. He'd been, his OPS is up until that time. Of course, there wasn't an OPS 
as such in existence then, but as we know now. But uh, he really hadn't delivered on his early promise through his fifth season. Uh, and as Alice mentioned, 1960 was a breakout season for him in a number of ways. Another another thing we need, need to mention, we neglected him so far. And he was a very, very pivotal figure in the 1950s, is Paul Richards, uh, who really was instrumental in bringing a lot of innovation to the game uh, and made the White Sox into the Go Go White Sox and then took over the Orioles and made them uh, into a contending team, too. And it's never really, I don't think, ever really gotten the appropriate credit because he never managed he never managed in a World Series. Uh, I think if he had, Paul Richard would have been a much more deserving Hall of Famer than Al Lopez. Oh, well, there's a, a biography came out of him a few years ago called The Wizard of Waxahachie uh, because he was from Waxahachie, Texas, and uh, it was a pretty good book. I don't know how uh, easily available it is, but I, I have a, I've got a copy of it when it came out. The last thing, the Boston Red Sox were the last team to integrate with Pumpsy Green. So 12 years after uh, the Dodgers did it and Jackie came, you know, Red Sox fans and uh, the management and all that, they were getting letters saying that they're racist. And there was, it was big up here in Boston, but they did not integrate. And uh, 59, so they were the last team to integrate. Also, another thing of that season, both uh, – Ted Williams and Stan Musial finally uh, be, became mortal. Williams had a bad neck problem uh, that hampered his power and his hitting overall, and he was hit uh, in the 250s, and Musial fell off to 275. Yeah. Uh, Musial was 37, and Williams was 41. At 40, uh, 41, and Musial was uh, 1920. He was... Uh, uh, 38 at that point. And, yeah. uh, and, and at that them, time, 38, yeah. it, it was old for a, for a, yeah. a, a ball player and especially for one uh, who was still an impact player. Williams had been an impact player up until, you know, through age 40, which was very, 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 very rare at that time. And I think Musio was so upset he went to the Cardinal management and told him to give him a pay cut. Yeah, you're right, yeah. You, can you see that happening today? <laughs> yeah, you don't see that. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, these players spent, uh, pitchers spent half the year out with, uh, you know, injuries, and they're still getting paid their uh, $15 million a year. But uh, anyway, 1959 also was the first year that Major League Baseball allowed interleague trading after the season without waivers. Yeah, that had been prohibited uh, uh, since right. the, uh, the peace settlement in 1903, unless waivers were uh, acquired on the uh, you know team a player uh, that they were trying to switch leagues, and there were some wild trades made in that off season, and the Indians, unfortunately, with Frank Lane, who went crazy, uh, did a couple of them. Uh, one of them was sending uh, Cal McLish, who had won 35 games in two years for the Indians, sending him to the uh, Cincinnati Reds, essentially for the Red second baseman, Johnny Temple. But beyond it was more than that. They got, they got Gordy Coleman to throw in in that deal, and he became a, a pretty good factor, for, pretty good first baseman for Cleveland early. I think he won a triple didn't crown. Really deliver. A, I think um, the, Gordy Coleman won, won a triple crown in the Southern Association. Yeah, yeah. Mobile. He, he was, he was, I remember he was a big part of the acquisition. And yeah, and Temple. But Clish never really delivered for, in the, you know, for Cincinnati. He, no, he was 4-14, uh, and, and then uh, he wound up going back to the American League. Uh, you know, I think after that season, he really didn't have it. And uh, Temple really never did much. He was a, you know, fairly consistent uh, <clears throat> hitter for the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, never really did much for the Indians at all. No, but the Indians made another. Well, they didn't, no, they didn't make the trade then. They made it after the '60 season. But uh, we can talk about that when we get to '61. But another another interleague trade that which did not pay off at all. Yeah, well, in 1959, yeah, the uh, uh, they also acquired Tio Francona for a washed up Larry Derby, and uh, from Detroit and. Uh, 
and Francona hit the 363. He uh, didn't have enough appearances to qualify for the title. Yeah, and Obi yeah, was uh, basically it was the end of his major league career. Yeah, and for Francona began the season pretty much on the bench. Cleveland had acquired Jimmy Pearsall. Yeah, for Vic Warts, yeah. For, yeah, to play center field. And Pearsall got off to a very bad start, uh, didn't hit. And Francona was riding the bench, occasionally pinch hitting. He'd play some first base once in a while in relief of power, uh, but only a game or two in the outfield. And it, we get, he got hot early in the season. And he ended up uh, becoming Cleveland's regular center fielder. Uh, down the stretch, and the only reason he didn't have enough bats to qualify is he didn't start playing regularly until the season was nearly half over, and they just couldn't get him up there enough uh, to get uh, to get the necessary qualification at bats. No, uh, uh, another interesting uh, transaction uh, change in lineup when Billy Martin, whom they've acquired to play second base, and you know really solidified their infield, got hurt early in the season. And they ended up, uh, I think they purchased him from the Dodgers, who Jim Baxis, a career minor leaguer. And Baxis came to the Indians. Uh, was basically, he was basically a third baseman and ended up playing second. And Cleveland moved their regular shortstop, George Strickland, to third. And when they got Woody Held, who'd been an outfielder, and put him on short. So they really mixed up their infield. And uh, it was unbelievable, you know, in some ways that, that a team with that that kind of patchwork infield could do as well as they did in 59. But uh, with Francona having a terrific year and Jim Baxes uh, hitting a lot of home runs, but uh, with a low batting average, I think he was in the 230s, but he hit uh, double figures in home runs, very rare for a second baseman at that time, had a lot of power. But uh, that was it. He wanted a raise at the end of the season, and Lane told him no, and Baxis was back in the minor leagues, never to be seen again. Well, uh, yeah, well, Harvey King uh, for the Tigers won the uh, uh, won the batting title uh, in the American League that season. I believe Rocky Colavio, uh won the home run title. He, he did indeed, tied with uh, Killebrew. Yeah, tied with Killebrew, and the RBI leader was uh, Jackie Jensen again, and that was Jackie Jensen. Uh, you know, last good season, he retired. <laughs> After uh, that season, for the first time, because he couldn't handle flying, he was petrified of flying, and uh, he, he got crazy every time they uh, took a flight. That they could because teams, uh, especially in the National League, start to fly out to uh, ball games because uh, it was uh, faster and uh, it was easier uh, for the teams to get there. So the old tradition of train travel. Basically, went uh, went out the door in, uh, in 58, 1958 and 1959. Jensen would come back uh, in 1961 for one final year, and then uh, permanently retire after that. And uh, uh, the the, uh, the trade that I mentioned earlier, the Pirates sending Frank Thomas to Cincinnati. Frank Thomas was hard to get uh, in the 220s for Cincinnati. And another thing that came out of the 1959 season was uh, Jim Brosnan, uh, the relief pitcher on the Cincinnati Reds, wrote a diary of that season, which would be released in 1960 in a book called The Long Season, which is really the first time it was the precursor of, uh, of many uh, you know, seasonal diaries that would follow. And, uh, yeah, it was an excellent book, excellent. Yeah, and it Good turned book. out the uh, more Brosnan wrote, the better he pitched. So, uh, and, so the the first interleague trade was a not meant to be trade between the Red Sox and the uh, Cubs, where the uh, Cubs sent uh, uh, Dave Hillman and uh, first baseman Jim Marshall to the Red Sox for first baseman Dick Carter. That was on record as the first. Uh, non waiver into a trade of uh, of all time, and uh, so we, in 1960 would prove to be the last year where both leagues had eight teams and played 154 games. Well, games, yeah. And uh, there was a, a book that came out by a, a man named Kerry King uh, a number of years ago. Go on, 1960. 
I was calling the last, the last season. Because the, the purists, it was the last uh, real season where every team played each other 22 times uh, for 154 games. And uh, uh, both ways, the, uh, there was all sorts of uh, pressure. Uh, the Branch Ricky uh, had decided to form a third league called the Continental League to bring uh, baseball, a second team, back into New York. And in order to uh, stop this, the both leagues, the major leagues, agreed to expand. The uh, National League uh, decided to bring in New York and Houston in 1962, and the American League decided they were going to beat them. And they'd bring in Los Angeles in 1961. They'd move the uh, current Washington team to Minnesota and bring a new team into Washington. And so this 1960 would turn out to be the last year of uh, the last year of uh, uh, 154 games. Uh, hitting also was in pretty much still in pretty much of a decline that season. Uh, the uh, Pirates would come out of nowhere and win the uh, National League pennant for the first time in 33 years. Uh, they won 27 games in their last turn at bat. Everything went right that could go right, did go right. <clears throat> and it was, uh, it was just absolutely remarkable. They won 95 games. They beat out the, uh, Braves and the Cardinals, uh, paced by Vernon Law, pitcher who won 20 games and won the, uh, <clears throat> Cy Young Award that year. Uh, they were still giving uh, alcohol just one award to the big leagues. Dick Grote was named the most valuable player. And the uh, home runs and RBIs, I believe, were won by Henry Aaron. So the Braves, the Braves uh, still had the nucleus of uh, uh, Aaron Matthews, uh, Spahn and Burdett, and, uh, <clears throat> but the rest of their... Uh, their players faded off to some extent, and they wound up uh, second. And the Cardinals, who challenged the, was the Pirates' main challenger for the season, uh, faded at the end and wound up third. The Giants, who started off with such promise after the 1959 season, ran into disarray, and they would wind up uh, in fifth place. And uh, the manager, Bill Ridley, who succeeded uh, Leo DeRocher, would get fired in mid-season. Well, meanwhile, in the American League, order was restored. The Yankees re- uh, acquired Roger Maris uh, from Kansas City in the offseason uh, with uh, shortstop Joe DeMastri and first baseman Ken Hadley, uh, and they sent Don Larson, who would go on to have a 1-10 record with the A's that year, Hank Bauer, who was 37 years old and had was on his way out, and Hank Bauer wanted to go home to Kansas City because that's where he lived. Norm Seaburn, who Stengel didn't like after he messed up the fly balls in the 1958 World Series, and the fourth player they sent there would would go on to become a player of legendary stature, marvelous Mark Thromberry, <laughs> who was a couple of years away from... Uh, uh, getting in mortality with the 1962 Mets. Now, Maris and Mantle became a very, very strong one-two punch. And the Yankees uh, won the, the American League pennant fairly easily, even though White Ford had a mediocre year. He was 12-9 and nine and uh, missed a good portion of the season with arm trouble. They finished uh, ahead of the resurgent Baltimore Orioles, who, as David mentioned, under Paul Richards, finally uh, came up. And uh, the, Orioles, uh, the Orioles hung around quite a while, though. In the, yeah, they had. They the Yankees winning. wound up winning the last 15 games of the season. And they needed it. The Orioles were, were chasing them pretty hard. Going yeah, out. and the Orioles, uh, the Yankees uh, beat them off in the series uh, about three weeks before the season ended. The White Sox uh, uh, had uh, came in third and uh, 
what happened from 1959 is uh, they reacquired Minnie Minoso from Cleveland. They got uh, Roy Seavers uh, from Washington, and they put Bill Veckel on the team at the time decided they needed a lot of power. And some of their pitchers uh, either – most of their pitchers had either bad years like early win and got old. Billy Pierce, who they shipped to the Giants in a couple of years – Bob Shaw and Dick Donovan didn't have uh, very good years. In fact, Donovan was so mediocre uh, uh, for them that they wound up exposing him to the expansion draft after that season. So their pitching wasn't uh, very, very good. Maris was elected uh, the most valuable player in the American League in 1960. With 39 home runs, 112 RBIs, and a uh, 283 batting average. So you can see uh, the hitting in that league uh, – Pete Reynolds, who uh, was a single sitting uh, infielder for the Red Sox, won uh, in the American League uh, with a 320, and Dick Roke won uh, with a 325 in the National League. So, hitting, uh, 1960 was a really, really weak hitting season. Uh, Reynolds was an interesting player. He's, he's largely forgotten today. He came up uh, as a shortstop with Washington. Yeah. Uh, he was converted to second base, and then before we knew it, he was on first base. Uh, and he he had a fairly lengthy career. He had a good left-handed stick, and I saw him play an old timers game at uh, Candlestick Park uh, back, I think about ninety one, maybe I think ninety or ninety one. And first pitch, uh, I can't remember who was pitching. Line single to left field, went the, went the opposite field. But he had a really sharp line drive, ran crisply to first base. But uh, I, I don't know what happened to Pete. I know he died. He did. He died not long afterwards. Died in 1991. He died in 1991. Died on a golf course. Oh, yeah, yeah. He pulled oh, this up. Don't tell me. Don't tell me that running to first base on that single. Oh, wow. No, I didn't. I didn't realize that. Yeah, he died. In, he died. From my understanding, he died on a golf course. Wow. And it must have been very He was 63, good. yeah. Yeah. Wow. And he was the number two card in the 1952 top set behind Andy Pafko, and probably that card uh, commands a, uh, a good amount of money. And, of course, also in those years, and Ian, you can attest to this also, the Yankees had a internecine relationship with the Kansas City A's. Yeah. And almost everybody in Kansas City would get on the team that was any – it was decent, would wind up on the Yankees. The uh, owner uh, of the Kansas City A's, Arnold Johnson, had business uh, dealings with uh, Del Webb, one of the Yankee co-owners, and Johnson had bought the uh, bought Yankee Stadium and the Kansas City Blues minor league stadium, and uh, Webb, in turn, paved the way for Johnson to buy the Kansas City A's after, uh, and transfer them from Philadelphia, they brought out the uh, uh, Connie Mack and his two uh, two sons. So uh, also one, there's another relationship between teams that isn't quite as wasn't quite as bad as the Yankee Kansas City relationship, but still was there. And it's very very nobody ever talks about this. The Red Sox and the Senators, and almost anybody who's any good for the Senators during that period of time would wind up on the uh, Red Sox. I think the only reason Eddie Yost didn't wind up there is because they had Frank Malzone at third base. But Mickey Vernon, Pete Runnels, Jackie Jensen, uh, yeah, ten, ten there's a whole slew of them that Jensen. wound up going from Boston to Washington. Yeah, you're right. That was and the Red Sox would get rid of their excess. Yeah. Yeah. No, nobody ever mentions that. So, no, uh, but it certainly it certainly was a factor. But even yeah. though the Red Sox never really caught on, the, Re the Washington sank to the depths of the American. In you know, oh, yeah, by yeah, 1959, that, they were a completely more of a franchise, and uh, you know, the American League couldn't wait to you know move them. My favorite team uh, from that era with Washington was the 1957 team, which uh, stole 13 bases. Yeah. And uh, for the season, and they were led by uh, their first baseman, Julio Becker, who stole three. Yeah. Who stole three. Yeah. 
Yeah, left now, I discovered this a uh, number of years ago. Uh, I was uh, going through the nest and con, and uh, that, uh, that's, that's something that's always uh, stuck with me. So in 1960, uh, that team managed to approve uh, that Killebrew and Allison, Camilo Pasquale uh, started to become a very effective winning pitcher. He was 17-10 and 10 that season uh, after being 28-66 and 66 in his first four seasons, and they rose to fifth place. So finally, when they got halfway decent, they moved to Minnesota. And then we got into the 1960 World Series, which, as uh, both of you probably realize, was the most, probably still to, even to this day, the most unusual World Series that we've ever seen. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The, the Yankees hit uh, in the seven games at 338. They outscored the uh, Pirates 55 to 27. They set all sorts of records. Uh, hitting records in that series, which had never been approached as a team, and the Pirates won in seven games. The three games that the Pirates lost were 16 nothing, 16-3, 10-0, and 12 nothing. This is when they, they won games 1, 4, 5, and 7, 6-4, 3-2, 5-2, to two, and 10-9. to nine. Whitey Ford... Uh, uh, shut the uh, Pirates out in Game 3 and Game 6. Uh, Stengel came into uh, a lot of criticism, uh, a lot of criticism for not starting Whitey Ford in the opening game. He started uh, the big winner of the season, Art Dittmar, who had won 15 games, and uh, Dittmar would get knocked out in that game and uh, would also lose the uh, fifth game. Need we mention that, Dar- that Dittmar arrived from Kansas City? Oh, yeah, he, with, with Bobby Chance uh, before 1957. And uh, the uh, uh, Pirates won, won, the, won the close games. Vernon Law won two games. Harvey Haddix won the fifth game. Bill Verdon, the Pirates center fielder who had a mediocre season, was... Uh, uh, involved in almost every big big situation that the Pirates uh, uh, got into during their four wins. He uh, made a couple of uh, very big catches and set the field during Game 4 and Game 5. He was the one that was hit the ball that hit Kubek in the throat in Game 7. And if you go through the play-by-play, which I did uh, a number of years ago, uh, he was involved in almost every critical situation that the Pirates faced during the four wins. And this, uh, the Pirates uh, had uh, Bob Friend was terrible. He got blasted both games that he started. Uh, Mickey Mantle hit a ball off a lefty named Fred Green in the second game of Forbes Field that went over the uh, center field wall over 450 feet out. And the Pirates had uh, uh, five pitchers, so they brought in all three of the uh, games where they, got, they were clobbered. And uh, uh, yeah, these guys had very, very high uh, rates. The Pirates really only had three pitchers in that series, uh, Vernon Law, the reliever, Elroy Face, and Harvey Haddix. And the seventh game what would go down as one of the all-time crazy games in the uh, history of baseball. It was a 10-9 game that lasted two hours and 36 minutes. There were no strikeouts in the game. I think those are the only game in World Series history where that happened. And the Pirates uh, started Vernon Law. They got the Yankees started Bob Turley, who really didn't have it by then. The Yankees got up to a four nothing uh, lead after three innings. Rocky Nelson, the backup first baseman, had a two run home run. Was batting cleanup for them in that game. And Law started to fade, and in the uh, fifth inning, they brought in Elroy Face. And they always served up a three-run home run to Yogi Berra, which put them ahead five to four. And uh, the Yankees scored two more runs to make the seventh going into the bottom of the eighth. They couldn't uh, touch Bobby Chance. And Bobby Chance uh, was pitching the... Pretty good ball, and after Gino Simoli 
right off the bottom of the ice with a single. Bill Varden had a ground ball to Tony Kubek, which looked like a short double play ball. And the ball jumped up and hit Kubek in the throat, put in first and second. Uh, the ball, the game was stopped for a while while uh, they uh, took Kubek off the field. They put in Joe DeMaestri as the backup shortstop in the game. Dick Rowe got a single off uh, Bobby Chance and was pulled. Bobby Chance was pulled after that hit. The Yankees then brought in a uh, pitcher named Jim Coates. So after a sacrifice, uh, uh, moved around as the second or third, a fly ball was hit, which didn't do anything. And Roberto Clemente came up. And he had a chopper between first and home. There were two outs. Everybody was running. And uh, uh, Coates failed to cover first base. Skyron fielded the ball, turned to throw the first base, and there was nobody there. So he ate it. That, they, uh, the Pirates scored and make it 7-6. And then Hal Smith came up, who was the backup catcher. Burgess was a uh, uh, – Smokey Burgess had been relieved for a pinch runner. Uh, and Hal Smith was up. Now, Hal Smith had played the five years previously in the American League with uh, the Orioles and the uh, Kansas City A's, and he was a dead, known to be a dead fastball hitter. And Johnny Blanchard told me at the card show he was, ca- he was catching for the Yankees because Howard was hurt and uh, Yogi Berra was out in left field. Uh, and Hal Smith wanted to, uh, and Coach wanted to throw a fastball Blanchard went uh, crazy and said, no, no, this guy, it's all hit, this guy hit. So Coates threw a fastball and, hit, and uh, he hit the ball over the wall. Th- hold on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was all this crap. All right. All right. That's the pills are in here. Okay. Uh, my head just walked in. I'm sorry. Uh, so anyway, uh, that put the uh, Yankees, ahead, the Pirates ahead nine to seven. Uh, Blanchard to his dying day never forget Colts for uh, Colts for throwing out fastball. So the Yankees bring uh, the Pirates bring a Bob Friend on the top of the ninth who had failed in the two starts, and he couldn't hold the Yankees at all. Uh, the Yankees tied the game up, and they had brought in Harvey Hacks to close out the uh, inning. They tied the game up on a play where uh, Mantle, Mickey Mantle was on first base. Uh, Gil McDougal, who was playing his last game ever, was on third base as a pitch runner. And Barra had a, uh, Yogi Barra had a uh, one-hopper, screaming one-hopper to Rocky Nelson at first base. Rocky Nelson fielded the ball, stepped on first to remove the uh, force. Mantle... Dove into the presence of Mike to dive back into first base and was safe, enabling McDougal to score from third. And, uh, yeah, I asked Dick Grote uh, when I interviewed him in 1985 what would have happened if Dick Stewart had been playing first base at that point. He said he didn't want to think about it. The guy uh, says he probably would have gone for extra bases and Mantle probably would have scored. So, anyway, the game was tied. Uh, I'm in Forbes Field. Uh, I snuck in with a friend of mine. We were watching the game in the dorm. We were 17 years old at the time. Dorm was two blocks. We ran over there, snuck into the left field bleachers. Uh, the, the Yankees brought in Ralph Terry to uh, Ralph Terry to uh, uh, pitch the ninth inning, and he threw two pitches to Bill Mazeroski. The second one, Mazeroski hit over the wall for a World Series ending home run. Uh, and the Pirates won the game 10-9. Uh, so the only time the seventh game of World Series has ever ended on a uh, uh, what we call nowadays a walk-off home run. And uh, the city of Pittsburgh went absolutely insane that night. I was 70 years old. My friends were 70 years old. We were freshmen there. And uh, we had never seen anything like that before. And the only thing I can... Uh, uh, claim to uh, seeing here was in 1986 when the Mets won the World Series against Boston. But it was really, really incredibly insane. I bought a program uh, for the World Series 
on my way out of the uh, Forbes Field for 50 cents, which I still have. It was an incredible A bit experience. of added perspective on, on Pittsburgh fans. Um, in 1960, uh, the P- Pittsburgh did not have an NBA team. They did not have an NHL team. And their pro football team, of course, was the Steelers. Uh, and the Steelers, as of yet, had not won a single, uh, you know, a playoff game. So they were only in one. They lost a, a division playoff. They lost in 1947. Division, division playoff, that was it. Right. And, that was it. Yeah. That was it. They never won a division. Oh, never got into the NFL title yeah. game. No. And uh, they still were uh, quite a ways away from oh, yeah. emerging as as the as the power that everyone knows them to be today. They were a running joke at that point. So that so, was, I, so Pittsburgh was a really a really a hotbed for baseball. Yeah, and uh, that, that was uh, they they drew uh, I think a million and eight for the year, which uh, at that time was the all time record. Uh, it was the all time record for years uh, for them in attendance, and it was just one of those things. Uh, that, you know, the team would uh, have some injuries, some off years, and 1961 would fall all the way. Uh, uh, down to uh, sixth place, and uh, but we'll get into that uh, next time. But uh, 1960 also the uh, the, the uh, stunner uh, trade before that season obviously was the uh, uh, day before the season opened. The Indians traded their uh, most popular player Rocky Calavito, who's the reigning home run champ, to Detroit, even up for uh, uh, the batting champion Harvey, Harvey King. King. Yeah, and it was so disappointed that the, the Indians would trade the Kane right after that season and the, to the Giants for a never was Willie Kirkland and a washed up Johnny Antonelli. Yeah, yeah. But okay, anybody want any? Kane was no by, by then no great shakes either. He had some decent years left, but never again was uh, a major factor. Uh, Does anybody want to add to this before we uh, close up? Yeah, Bill Zach, he, he um, broke tradition and he threw on names on the back of the uh, of the uh, jerseys, and everyone yeah. went wild. <laughs> everyone went wild, saying, "Oh my God, it's the end of the world!" They got their names on the back of their jerseys, but uh, the commissioner ruled you have an option to do that. Um, the sporting news, and we always spoke about Teddy uh, Ballgame getting the short end of this thing when it came to the MVP. He was voted the best player, uh, the player of the decade from the 1950s. Um, of course, uh, the Negro Leagues officially died in 1960. That was it. Uh, and um, after um, the World Series, we all know, uh, they, they told um, Casey Stengel that uh, the Yankee Brass told him that uh, that's it. You know, he's too old. Um, besides saying, you know, I'll never make that mistake of being 70, there, all, 70 years old, they, he also said, they examined all my organs. Some of them are quite remarkable and others are not so good. Yeah. Museums are bidding for them. <laughs> and they also uh, 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 retired George Weiss, who was the uh, you know, incredibly successful uh, uh, farm director and general manager who was associated with them for uh, you know, 30 years at that point. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, we'll get into all that next week. Okay, yeah, gentlemen? Yeah, you mentioned Rocky Calavito. Um, he's still yeah. alive. And oh, yeah. I, um, I had Bill Cachetas on my um, on my uh, show yesterday. We talked about the Bankery uh, Phillies. But he's doing the biography of uh, Rocky, and uh, Rocky has diabetes like I have, and he just had a leg. Uh, I know, he had a leg removed, yeah. yeah. Oh, Lou Brock. I didn't know that. Lou Brock had a leg removed also. Well, I didn't know yeah. that either. Uh-huh. You know, Facebook, I can, you know, you, I'm on Facebook all the time. You get all these, these updates from all these people who keep track of this stuff. Anyway, gentlemen, uh, as usual, a pleasure. Next week, uh, we'll be able to do 1961 through 1964, uh, hopefully, which 1964 will mark the end of the uh, Yankee dynasty and the coming of uh, expansion into the uh, major leagues. Those are probably going to be the two big topics next time around. Hey, I want to thank right. you both. And thank the thank the both of you. And we'll see you see you back time. next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. You bet. Thank you both. Good night. <laughs>